Hello and welcome to episode 185 of Page One, the Writers Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us on the podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. Um, and as ever, I will say that there is a great back catalogue <laughs> of previous guests there, so please do go and check that one out. But this week, unsurprisingly, we have another great guest. Yeah, we do indeed. We just finished chatting with the awesome Eliza Chan, who is a Scottish-born fiction author um, who uh, writes about East Asian mythology, kind of British folklore. Um, she's had a whole bunch of short stories published uh, in various uh, places like The Dark and Fantasy Magazine. And her debut novel, Fathom Folk, um, which came out just February 2024, uh, was a number one Sunday Times bestseller. Yeah, and, and we chat to her about that. Um, she tries to downplay that rather massive achievement, um, <laughs> wrongly in our view. Uh, Absolutely wrongly. Yeah, um, but yeah, no, it's a really interesting chat about, you know, the difference in writing between sh- writing short stories and, and longer form fiction and also mm-hmm. a bit of chat about as well the, you know, representation of different cultures in stories like Fathom Folk, which there hasn't always been in publishing and there seems to be, uh, at least a bit more of an appetite for it now, which is which is always a good thing. So um, it's a great chat. So we'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our writer's notebook, and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story, so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Because I think I'm right in saying you've had quite the array of jobs um, before you had your first published book, so was it always yeah. the always the goal? Um, yes and no. So I I always liked being creative. You know, I was I would say I was an artist, but I was a kiddie artist, um, and I liked writing as a kid. But I was from a Chinese background, and my parents were very much like, "Oh no, no, you're not going into the arts. You're being a lawyer, a doctor, or a dentist." Um, <laughs> so it was very much a hobby for me because I was told, "You know, you don't do that. We we don't take these sort of risks. You need something um, much more." sensible and bill paying um, so it was always kind of on hold and I knew I was going to go to uni and do something um, but at the back of my mind I always had this but one day one day I'll get the novel published um, and and I did I guess it just took a lot longer than I thought it was going to take um, but yeah definitely always wanted this since I was a kid I 
Yeah, and and as we'll get on to later on, I think it was probably worth the wait. Um, but um, you, I, I think I'm right in saying that you you started writing. Well, I don't know if you were writing long form fiction beforehand, but you the your first success, I suppose, in getting published was with short fiction. Yeah, so I kind of came at it a funny way. So I grew up near Glasgow, so I joined the Glasgow. Um, well, science fiction back then, but it's now spec fic writing group. Um, and a lot of them were writing short fiction um, and they gave some really great advice. And I did, I muddled through my first really awful novel between I think the ages of like 16 to 21. I wrote this, you know, terrible insert self, half elf, tropish <laughs> mess. And they did, bless them, they, they read it and tried to give me feedback. And I think I sent it to about one agent, two agents back in the day where you actually had to post the whole thing, you know, in a manila yeah. envelope. Um, and then even I realised, oh, this is a mess. Um, and I think because all of them were writing short fiction and they were like, you know what, you just need to keep practising, I kind of fell into it sideways and started writing a bit of short fiction. And, and for me, it was always going to be, I'll do this for a bit until I get a bit better. And I'll do this for a bit until I get a bit better. And then I sort of got stuck in it. And I think part of it was I ended up being in circles with other short fiction writers and it became a you know once you've got a, a couple of anthologies or publications you want to go for the pro um, magazines and you know those sort of side goals that sort of sidetracked me yeah. um, and I think there's a lot of like I love short fiction I think it's a very different art form to tell a concise story but I also think for me I was using it as an excuse because I really struggled to write longer form and that was a good convenient excuse I could write you know a short story it's a lot shorter and you got that sort of adrenaline boost when when you got an acceptance which I knew from the novel world was going to be a lot harder mm. so I was kind of like you know I'm, I'm honing my craft for like 15 20 years <laughs> um, before I finally came back to novel writing and I did I, I did start a couple of novels but I really didn't ever finish them and I think the only thing that really pushed me near when I actually completed this was I met someone on Twitter, a really nice author called Maisie Chan, who writes um, children's books. And we just had a chat about representation and she was the first British Chinese author I'd, I'd ever interacted with. Like, obviously, there were some Asian Americans writing out there, but for me, it was a real eye opener. Um, and she offered to mentor me and just having that accountability is actually what pushed me through this. I think without her, it would be another half finished novel mm -hmm. somewhere in my computer. So yeah, that took the very, very long way round to get here. So Twitter isn't all bad then? <laughs> it wasn't all bad back in the day. I mean, I can't say you can necessarily find those relationships now, but Yes, back in the day, it really was like, wow, the first British Chinese author ever met. I, and I mean, if it wasn't for Twitter, I wouldn't know of the existence of a lot of the Asian American authors writing in genre. Like it really did come to light through the circles of friends I was making on there. I don't know about now. It's, yeah, it's a different story. <laughs> well, you, you said there that you were writing your short fiction because you kind of, you know, you were worried that writing longer fiction was too hard. But then how... How hard is it to get short fiction published? You know how, you know how easy is it in comparison? I mean, I'm assuming it's not an easy thing to get to get book to get short stories, you know, sold to magazines and places like that. No, I think it's I think it's probably just as difficult. I mean, I don't have the statistics, but I know because a lot of people think, oh, I'll just write short fiction; it'll be a bit faster. But there's a mm -hmm. completely different skill set in telling a story concisely. Um, and also a lot of short fiction is where you can really play with with styles and art forms and like um, different voices, um, like first person, second person, things like that. So it's really fun that way. Mm -hmm. But in terms of getting published in the sort of magazines that um, have a massive readership, like um, fantasy and science fiction, Uncanny, um, yeah, it's it's just as bad, if not worse. I don't I don't know. I know like Uncanny only generally open about once a year and they get something thousands and thousands of um, submissions in that one submission period. So it's 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 not easier, which is I think what I thought to begin with. 
Um, I think it's a fun craft, but it's quite a different, some things obviously are transferable, but some things it's just a completely different style that you have to do because you are you are very restricted by that word count. Um, I think what it can do, what, what the positives I'd say from it is, you get a lot of rejection. So when it came to the novel and getting rejection, I don't think I was I was potentially more resilient to it because I'd, I'd had all those micro rejections from short fiction. Um, and also, you know, you do get some acceptances. So there's that little serotonin burst when you've got a little anthology and your name's in it or in a magazine. And, and that's really lovely. And, and building up a network. So I, I know a lot of writing friends from the world of short fiction, which is really nice because... Um, I wouldn't have had that that network, yeah, without all those years wandering through the short fiction markets. And and for for people that are listening that are sort of wanting to get into short fiction, I mean, what is the what is the base route into? Is it is it just reading a lot of short fiction and and finding where your story might be best placed, that sort of thing? Yeah, I would definitely say that. I would say. There's a lot of different, even within the genre, um, sort of sci-fi fantasy genres, a lot of different magazines out there that are looking for completely different stuff. So some of it is looking for um, things that are quite cutting edge in terms of the the use of the space and the use of the voice and the style and, and I guess a more literary end. And then there's other places that really are more... Um, I guess more into we're specifically after some Cthulhu based um, stories or specifically like mm. this is the theme. Um, so there's anything from pulp to, you know, climate sort of fiction to cozy. Um, it's it's looking around and reading around and seeing the sort of stories you like and the magazines you like. They're the ones you probably want to submit to. Um, there's some great resources out there. And um, there's a submissions grinder, yeah. um, which is a free website where you can search basically by how long your story is, what genre it is, and it pops up showing what markets are currently open and then getting a feel for things that way. Um, that would be the advice I'd give I. Yeah, I've looked at the the submissions grinder myself, but it also tracks like the response times to short stories and stuff like that. Albeit, me as someone that was always terrible at maths, I have some difficulty parsing the the, the graphs that they show and things like that. But it is all there, and it is a useful resource, definitely. Um, but you, you, so you turned it, well. You decided with the help of Maisie Chan, I'm going to write a longer form fiction and so did you did you have an idea that you had been wanting to develop or was that something you developed in in discussion with Maisie um no I had an idea so basically I'd done I'd, I'd had this idea and I'd written um for NaNoWriMo um a really awful first well how many words is it in NaNoWriMo I've already forgotten it's 50,000 isn't it 50,000 yeah. right so I'd managed yeah. that and I think it's the only year I'd managed it, um, but it was so awful I couldn't look at it ever again. Um, it was just like, it was me proving to myself that I could write 50,000 because I hadn't done that in so long. And then it sat in a drawer. So when she came along and she said, what What do you want me to mentor you on? I said, well, I want to finish this novel that I'd started, you know. So I'd already had the seed idea um, and really her mentorship was there to give me sort of that. I'm, I'm so like old school I need a teacher on my back saying here's your deadline but her just going I'll check in with you in two months um, and me going oh no Maisie's going to be disappointed if I don't write it that's really what pushed me through mm. the whole first draft and I think the really good bit of advice she gave me because I just couldn't open that that file because the NaNoWriMo experience was great for telling me I could do 50,000 but it was in such a state I didn't know where to begin and she said just don't open it. You, you'd remember in your head the main bones. You've told me mm -hmm. that it's a mess. Just start from scratch um, and it'll feel a lot more manageable. Um, and she was completely right because the main essence of the story is what I remembered mm -hmm. as opposed to, yeah, the chaos of that draft. Um, and that's how we got it. Excellent. And and that was obviously Fathom Folk, which was your first book, came out February 2024. So yes. do you want to tell us a little bit about what the book's about and and, and what people should expect from, from reading it? Uh, yeah, so my elevator pitch is what if The Little Mermaid 
was a pissed off immigrant in a semi-submerged East and Southeast Asian inspired city. And it was never for the love of a man, it was for the love of her home. Um, so the novel is basically about set in a semi-modern sort of cityscape, multicultural cityscape, and the city's half flooded. And the Fathom folk are folk like mermaids, sirens, kelpies, kappas, water dragons from all all walks of life, different sea-based mythology from across um, yeah, different countries and different cultures. Um, and they've come onto land um, to work in the city due to a number of reasons, including pollution and economics. But the humans are the ones at the top, literally at the top of these skyscrapers looking down on them. Um, and it's a novel about prejudice and discrimination and class differences. But it's also a novel for me about being someone that doesn't fit in, being part of a diaspora, um, but thinking, how do you change a system that might not want to be changed, that might not welcome you, but is the only place you've ever known as home? Um, so it's, yeah, but I added mermaids because why not, basically. <laughs> and do you think with with stories like that, where there is better, more representation um, or you know of people that haven't ha traditionally had um representation in novels like this before do you think the publishing scene is being is becoming more open to that sort of story and it's being more embraced by readers as well i think it is to a degree i think i think there's definitely more um non-european based fantasy kicking around now which i'm really mm -hmm. glad of like i love reading um from other sort of points of view and seeing other sort of world building out there. I think at the moment, my concern, I guess my, I think because it's just baby steps, it's very much most of it in the epic fantasy and mythology retellings sort of area, um, which again, you know, no shade to that, it's really well written and it's lovely. I think what I wanted to do, and, and is a bit to one side, is I wanted to show modernity without going to science fiction um, and I think that's less developed but I know I would say generally like urban fantasy is a dirty word isn't it right now having a sort of modern we call it modern contemporary secondary world <laughs> fantasy is is urban fantasy by any other name that yeah. isn't as big a market but that is very much where I wanted to set my story because for me it was about I don't want to talk about alternative history or or like epic fantasy is generally you know whatever culture it is you're looking at three four hundred years ago sort of fantasy version of it I wanted to talk about now because or nowish um because cities to me are, are quite modern and multicultural um so yeah there is more scope I would say generally but I would say it has almost become a niche box in itself mm -hmm. um sometimes and i'm hoping that work like this will will sort of push it a little bit more outside of epic or, or alternative history um but yeah i mean we can only hope can't we yeah, yeah. i mean and because I, I think you're, you're right we've seen certainly a massive kind of explosion of like mythology retellings from a kind of female perspective you know jennifer saint and madeline miller books and stuff obviously the mm -hmm. kind of biggie ones and and I, I, how much of that you think is a is a trend in the in the sense that it's like it will kind of come to an end at some point, or, and how much of it is a stepping stone to a kind of permanent marketing lands, landscape where you've got kind of more open, diverse stories? Is that a permanent destination that that we're moving to? You think, or is this all just a bit of a, a flash in the pan trend that might die out? I'm. I don't know, like I'm not a, a publisher or an agent. What I would say from a personal point of view is I feel like the Greek mythology retellings feels quite oversaturated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a whole sub genre, isn't it? But yeah. it feels like there's so much going on there now. I'm hoping though that we're not, that publishing itself is not just going to go retellings are done because it is not oversaturated when it comes to other cultures and other countries sort of retellings you know there's definitely tons still out there and um, so I don't want publishing just to go right we're done I also think retellings 
we're just obsessed with them um, as people. Yeah. I think, you know, we always, no matter what culture you're brought up in, you have your folk tales and fairy tales from childhood that you tell over and over and over again. Um, so it's our typical one in, in Chinese. So um, Gam Yong, Jin Yong wrote um, Condor Heroes. And when I was a kid, basically every four or five years, basically they would do a TV series of the same epic sort of uh, wusha fantasy and then five years time, there'd be another one and there'd be another one and there'd be another and you just couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. Um, and to this day, they still go and there's either TV series or films. And, and I would say it's the same um, in Europe with, you know, we come back to Arthur, we come back to Cinderella, Snow White, yeah. we come back to Spider-Man. I mean, it's just like there's something comforting about that. And I don't think we will ever completely let go of that. I do like how it's modernised and each generation brings its own themes its own as you say it's now at the moment feminist retelling so who knows maybe in 10 years it becomes a slight twist retellings i don't think we'll ever be done with retellings but the sub genres of retellings i think might change because i feel like fairy tales have quietened down a bit it was really big at one point now it's mm -hmm. greek mythology so i'm hoping yeah there'll be some other retellings i don't know what exact subgenre. personally i love arthurian retellings i mm. think there's a lot to play with there um yeah so i just think it'll keep going but different ones yeah yeah that makes sense and and was so was fathom folk the the first novel that you had actually finished other than this one that you wrote when you were 16 yes <laughs> yes and and so what was your process in writing that and and does your writing process differ for that sort of longer form and compared to your short stories and stuff do you with a short story do you just maybe not need as plan to plan as much or anything like that is are there differences like that oh definitely 100% so short stories generally i just had either an idea or a character and i would just write because generally my short stories would sit around three to 5,000 words. So mm -hmm. if you're halfway through and you decide, oh, wait a minute, I'm changing my mind, it's easy enough to alter. Um, my process for writing a novel, I would say, was chaotic. I'm hoping not to replicate that process <laughs> again because it was a bit too chaotic. Because, you know, we went from, as I said, the Nano Remo sat in a drawer, 50k, to the first draft I did under uh, my mentor's support. And it started off um, basically being London or Manchester. And I got about a third of the way in and I realized I was really struggling with the world building because it was really hard for me to envisage um, a semi-submerged British city. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept pulling information from East and Southeast Asia, because there is, there's monsoons, there's flooding, there's a lot of folk that live on boats or in stilt houses. And I was going, why have I said it in basically <laughs> Europe? Why have I done that to myself? <laughs> so there was a massive rewrite there. Um, it went from one point of view to three points of view. So there was another massive rewrite there. So I would hope the future novels and not as chaotic as that. And I think very much I was learning because, as you said, I hadn't written a long-form novel since I was 16, so I was learning as I went. Um, thankfully, it all turned out okay, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's necessarily the best and most efficient way <laughs> yeah. to write a novel. I, I, I mean, I guess I guess you had your nano... Although you didn't look back at the, the nano remote, I suppose that gave you some sort of structure or some sort you know some elements of that allowed you to in a way it was a very very long planning session I suppose you could look yeah. at it as. yeah yeah something like that I... and and when you write do you do you show your writing to other people before you before you send it out there or anything like that or do you do you sort of hone it and then just send it out and see what happens uh, no, so I've got a few beta readers, um, sort of like crit partners that um, I've had for years that I really trust and, and I think get my style and I get theirs. So um, after, I, I wouldn't have sent them the first draft though because it was a mess. Um, so after about two or three drafts when I thought, I've done as much as I can, but there's something missing. That's when I asked them to give it, give it a read, um, give me some feedback. Um, so you did that and then 
yeah, I sort of tweaked it based on their feedback before I started looking for an agent. Um, and for me, that was a really important step because sometimes you just get a feeling something's wrong, but you can't figure out why. Um, mm -hmm. So I think getting feedback off other people, even if they don't give you the right answer, they just sort of tell you their feeling of, of what's niggling them and that can just spark something yeah, for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. I think often it's, you get feedback from people that have read it and and often they kind of say oh, I had a problem with this and here's what I think you should do and you think well I don't think I want to do that because that's the wrong fix but I you know I appreciate that you've, your problem for you that you've had with it and sometimes you, all you need is that is someone to say I was struggling with this concept or this character or whatever and then you, it's up to you to find I'll fix it in a different way that it could be something at the start of the book or a little bit or something that that fixes the problem but it's it's knowing well, how much you take from a beta reader isn't it like do you take the whole solution or do you just take their issue and work on the solution yourself separately yeah and i think like my husband's great for that he's not a writer but he likes to hear my ideas and he'll always give me his own ideas back and most of them i just go that is ridiculous i would do that <laughs> i would do this but just talking it out yeah. and yeah. him giving me yeah. the silly ideas is, is what me makes me then go don't do that you do that and I go, oh, okay why well, didn't i think of that in the first place mm -hmm. i think a beta readers for me it's important to have more than one and um, definitely i had about I think I had about four. Um, and if one person just says all this stuff that no one else mentions, then you can kind of be like, okay, that might be their personal opinion or they've yeah. misunderstood or, or they're yeah reading something. But if all of them have found similar issues, you think, okay, that, that's, that's on me. I need to fix that. And as you say, you might not take their solutions, but if four out of four of your sample are struggling with something, then it is probably worth looking at. Yeah, I, I think Stephen King said a similar thing that if, if 10 people give you different things, it doesn't matter. But if, all, if they're all saying the same thing, then then yeah, <laughs> there's maybe an issue you need to address. But so so with with your short stories, I want to, I want to talk about the sort of route to getting published with Fathom Folk. And with your short stories, obviously you can submit those directly yourself and you manage it all yourself or generally that's what happens. But mm -hmm. um with the novel, uh, did you did you go down the usual route of finding an agent, finding a publisher that way, and and how did that happen? Uh, yes. So after I'd polished it as much as I could, uh, I started looking for agents. So again, I think knowing a lot of other authors, I'd, I'd seen some of their journeys, so I had a good idea of right. You got to make your shortlist and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, and I did so. I submitted to. I don't know about 20 agents um to start with um and I got within a couple of weeks I got um quite a junior agent um but um very keen and offered me um representation and that oh. sort of absolutely kicked everything off because then you go back to the other agents going someone's interested are yes. you interested um and I ended up with with four offers um within right. about a month which was wild like completely unexpected um i do think to be completely transparent some of that help that i had been kicking around you know i, I go to conventions i know some authors that already have agents and maybe my name was mm. a, a, not a big name but they, they'd heard of me i wasn't completely unknown so maybe that did move me to the top of someone's pile i'm not sure um and like three out of the four agents that offered were based in the uk which again i think is quite interesting because i am uk based um, and i think there was a bit of a priority there um so that yeah so that was lovely so i got to choose which i found more stressful than i thought it would because i was like what if i make the wrong choice but i ended I, up I, with I, my I, now yeah, I was I was going to ask about that because yeah, obviously that's that's a, it's a nice position for for authors to be in at that point because uh, you know everyone's wanting an agent and then if you get mm -hmm. multiple offers, I mean, how what what were the factors that went into your decision? Did you speak to people? Uh, you know, how, how did you make that final decision? Yeah, so I spoke to all the agents on the phone and sort of asked for their strategy, like what they liked about the novel, where they would place it, who they'd submit it to, to just get a feel of, did they really get it? Um, but also all of them wanted a bit of editing before we went out to a publisher. So again, what sort of edit changes would they make? And, and did I agree with them, I guess? Because if they wanted me to make some changes that I disagreed with, then potentially 
they, they didn't really align with with what I was seeing myself doing. But I also reached out to some other clients of theirs just to get a feel for how they were as an agent behind the scenes. Um, and then after that, I think I just, I really just went with my gut. <laughs> I think after a while, you're just like, I'm overthinking everything. Um, so the agent I chose in the end is one that's a bit more established. So he's done more deals. Um, I had a few friends that had already were, were represented by him and were quite happy with him. Um, and he was probably most on my my list before I started of like, oh, if he offered me representation, he'd yeah. be one of my mm-hmm. dream agents. Um, and I that's, that's who I went with in the end. But I think ultimately, I think if people worry a lot that this is like their only chance. But I think... I now on the other side see that a lot of people have parted ways from their agent and they've had two or three agents over their career and ultimately it's a it's a business relationship yeah. um yeah. and that you know businesses do come to an end um you know you, you might change your agent further down it's not a one shot and you're done um even though it feels like that at the moment the moment you're in it um but yeah I'm I'm happy with my choice um <laughs> and yeah still with them I think that's a really good good point. And I, I certainly chat to authors who have said similar, you know, and, and that it's it's almost more unusual to have the same agent throughout your entire career. And it's it's you know, as you say, it is a business you know relationship, and it's it's, it's that kind of quasi kind of business and friendship, etc. And kind of and it's and the more pal you get with them, the kind of more difficult it feels like you're kind of breaking up with someone that's kind of awkward but and also i think there's a there's a thing that plays into it which is that it is you know it is very difficult to get an agent in the first yeah. place so yeah so when, there can once be, you find someone yeah think, exactly I don't, I don't want to start from scratch again yeah exactly that, and that's yeah. i think there's a lot of puts a lot of people off ever moving agent is, is the thought of going back into the cold again and oh, it took me two three years for an agent to wonder again but the difference is that you're not the same person you were Mm. That that first time, or you know, you've hopefully you've had some published book, or, and I think even if you haven't had any, anything published, the fact that you're with an agent already, that you're finding another agent, shows that someone else independently thought you were yeah. a good writer and you wrote good stuff oh. of, of a high quality, and that itself is a watermark of or a mark of success. I think so. I think it's. I, I think. I, I think. I think you're right. I think people out there who who are nervous about changing agents, it's it's something which everyone does. I think two or three times over the course of their career and it's a normal thing um, right. but getting back to um, Fathom Folk um, obviously it's been a huge success it came out February just last uh, this year um, and oh. it was am I right in saying number one in the Sunday Times upon release I mean that must have been pretty exciting it was exciting it wasn't quite on release so I mean yeah you're 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 oh, no. uh, listen no, your listeners are probably know this by now. It was picked by one of the sub boxes, so that is how it got quite a massive boost. Uh, okay. Week the week they sent, they delivered all the boxes um, out. Is where where the boost came from. Uh, it's frankly. still it's still um, there. It still gets to the top of the list. It's, it's, still, it's still there. I yeah. and it's like. Wait, are you trying that, to say that that that's that's not that that that, that won't count as an official? I don't series. know. I feel I feel like I've cheated the system, but you know, <laughs> oh, like. See, right. But and it's also like I was incredibly lucky. It was quite a quiet week, I would say. Um, and like in comparison, like the other figures, because I know some weeks when the big hitters come out, it wouldn't have been number one. But yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll write it anywhere I can. Absolutely. Number one bestseller. Um, Absolutely, you can put I mean, that these, in all these... your books going forward forever. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. I mean these these boxes are they're becoming bigger and bigger because there's they're, mm-hmm. and they're they're everywhere now. There's like there's three or four, and I know some places don't count them, and some places. You know, and so certain boxes don't get counted, and certain boxes do. And I never quite understand how they decide is it, if they're affiliated with a bookstore or something, some kind of process. But well, yeah, yeah. Th- th- bestseller they're... lists as a whole are, are a strange beast because I they think the very, New York Times very, curate their list in a way, so it's not even to do with the best selling books. It's just what they think are the best of the books that yeah. are selling. So they actually they actually pick yeah. They make up the list. It's not just sale numbers. No, they actually, curate it. Yeah, yeah, they decide. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know a couple of authors who technically, in terms of figures, should have got on the New York Times bestseller list, but they got discounted because they were genre, which yeah, is exactly. offensive. Oh, right. Yeah, and then there's also all these that's stories amazing. that 
that so the the New York Times list they take it from certain bookshops so they don't they don't take the figures across the country they go to certain bookshops and and ask how many they've sold and the people that know all those bookshops like certain politicians in America will just go and mass buy hundreds of books from each <laughs> yeah, of those bookshops. Actually, I haven't heard of folk do that yeah. before. It sounds like the old kind of Nielsen way they used to go around to certain people's houses and say what did you watch last night and then you know they like extrapolate that <laughs> yeah, up to, exactly, like, to, yeah. to, to the whole yeah. nation but it'd be based yes. on like four households or whatever. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, fathom folk in in any in any and, but again, manner means, number it's been one, number, number one. one Sunday Times. That's yes. the most important thing. Exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, it. that uh, you 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 try and downplay it, but it's, you know, great achievement, and it must feel great that that's happened with your with your debut novel, um, and give you some confidence going into going into your next one as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's brilliant. I've had so much support. I think. There's a lot of fear, I think, when you finally, you know, like this has been a dream since I was a kid and yeah. you finally get it. And then you think, no, but it's not going to be as good as I think it is. And I mean, I've, I've been incredibly lucky. You know, I've been listening to things like Publishing Rodeo. I know this does not happen for everyone, um, but the support my publishers put behind it has been amazing. Um, you know, the cover has done so much of the heavy lifting. It's stunning, which has made uh, all the social media sort of, bloggers and instagrammers and tiktokers want to talk about it so it's basically been free media which has been great but you know my publisher have pushed it and you know mm -hmm. they did arcs and and it um it's it's gone over quite well i would say some people don't like it but there are always going to be people that don't but i think it's, it's starting to find its readership and i think um it's been lovely it's just been i still don't believe it i think that's why i don't play everything because i'm like nah come yeah, on exactly. you're all you're all gonna realize tomorrow that i just made <laughs> words up and put them in an order yeah i I, th I suspect that feeling i think i think a lot of authors have that feeling throughout their whole careers in fact <laughs> it never quite it never quite feels real but but i am um, so what are you what are you working on just now what what's the next book in the pipeline um, so Fathom Folk is a duology, so I am doing the edits on book two, um, so I'm not sure how much I can tell you other than it's the end of the yeah, duology, well, continuation, it's hopefully out next year if everything goes to plan, um, and that's, that's as far as we've got, and then I'm sort of tinkering away at another novel that I want to do after that, um, I have no idea if I'm going to get to, if, if they want to buy this or not yet, um, it's unclear but I'm having fun basically I've had enough of sadly as much as I love the watery world and all my metaphors and mermaids uh, I need a break for now so I'm going to hopping vampires instead because oh, why nice. not nice <laughs> hopping vampires yeah, yeah what, is hopping vamp what is the hopping deal is the hopping it? Uh, the Hopping Vampire is from Chinese traditional sort of folklore um, okay. and you call them vampires because it's vampire zombies are sort of in between but there's some sort of monster the reason they hop um is because apparently when people used to have to so people used to exhume bodies and move them because if your family was moving you would take the, the bodies of your ancestors with them because otherwise um they would become hungry ghosts um and apparently the, they used to do this in the middle of the night because no one wants to see a bunch of dead bodies it's bad luck um and they and they would put them they would put them on poles under their arms. I don't know, I'm doing right. this. Poles under their arms on both sides, and there'd be a carrier at the front, a carrier at the back, moving these lines of it looks like walking corpses. Um, and so I guess if you woke up and you looked bleary eyed across across the landscape, you would just see what looked like a bunch of people hopping along. Yeah. Um, that and that's very how, spooky. yeah, the sort of spooky monster mythology folk tales came about. Oh. Um, yeah, but they're also they were made very famous by a bunch of nineteen eighties um, Hong Kong films, um, including Mister Vampire, which were very silly, sort of equivalent of Hammer House films, mm -hmm. um, and I love that. And I just kind of wanted to write something about these hopping vampires that no one—they're not sexy at all, by the way. They're not—they're not like Western <laughs> yeah. vampires. Uh -huh. You would not want to make out with these vampires. <laughs> they are—they are grey and gross, but the kind of nostalgic for me so i've I'm started writing quite a nostalgic cheesy book um about hopping vampires and basically buffy the vampire slayer um but yeah chinese version um for a cool. 
look forward to that it's one. Big, hey, but, uh, before we wrap up, I did want to ask about, uh, I read that you've got a love of, of tabletop gaming, um, uh, yes. and uh, which is, is I, I find, you know, I, I love that as well, but I find that writers in this especially seem to be drawn to this because obviously there is a, there is a huge opportunity for storytelling and and that sort of thing. Is that is that what attracts you to you to it? Partly, I think I I really like being sociable. I think more than anything. Mm. So I really got into tabletop gaming as a as a yeah meeting up with friends and we'd all play a game together. Um, and I particularly I don't like ones where you backstab each other. Like I hate things like risk. I can't handle it. Yeah. I find it really upsetting when my friends <laughs> lie and backstab. But I love cooperative games or, or games of as you say a, re- a real storyline to them, like the legacy games that have yeah. become more popular. And um, and I really enjoy that sort of social aspect more than anything. I think my only issue with tabletop games is so many of them are grounded in historical periods that were quite uncomfortable in hindsight when you're like look we're colonizing this place or cutting down its resources and you think oh oh how can we've ended up here um but i really like stuff like the captain is dead is really fun or like wingspan things that are quite yeah not directly aggressive towards your friends is yeah. what i like kind of asymmetrical Kind of yeah. play your own game a little bit and then just see who's done the best at the end. Yeah. yeah. Cool. What was the last book that you read? And um, the last book I read was Darker by Four by June Seal Tan, who I'm doing an event with this uh Thursday, uh, which is like a fun YA book, but it's basically based in her love of anime and like Chinese dramas and computer games and stuff and it's it's just very fun um, and I really like that it's anime inspired because back in the day people would like, start turn their nose up at that like oh yeah that's... whereas now I feel like it's it's really yeah more acceptable and more fun and yeah and yeah it's a really good fun read if you like magic skills and um, monster hunters and gods coming to upset plans. Nice. Um, what about the last film that you watched? Last film I watched was June Part Two, um, which Very was nice. good. Mm. Better, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I think it was to me it was slightly over long. Um, it could have been cut for at least half an hour. Um, but I like what they did with Chani's character and and the the actually bringing the female characters some agency and some personality. Um, I do think they missed a bit of the the, the like weirdness of the books, I guess. I think mm. they tried to make it a lot more serious. And, and like I love the message about um, someone being put in this pedestal as a messiah and how, how sort of wrong it was in a way. But I think I also wanted to just to see like the Spacing Guild and weirdness a bit mm. more. Um, but... Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. That respect. Cool. And nice. um, what about TV? What are you watching on TV at the moment? TV, I tend to do one really like easy going comfort watch, and then one thing that makes me think because I can't do them. Yeah, I basically need need both. So my yeah. easy going like cozy watch is Spy Times Family, which is an anime about a spy who needs to have a fake family and accidentally recruits an assassin um, and a little girl that can read minds and it's very cute and, you know, they're dysfunctional, but they end up having this lovely found family. Um, And in terms of complicated making me think, I'm watching The Three Body Problem at the moment. Oh, yeah, okay. I've not seen that, but, yeah, is is it good? Have you read the book? I've not read the book, so I'd... um, so I'm intrigued and we're only about halfway through. I think it's 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 been really good for me. The reason I didn't read the book is because the sort of hard science intimidated me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's nice seeing that visually. Um, I think it's got a lot of really interesting ideas. Um, and we'll, we'll see where it goes, I guess. But yeah. yeah. We've been watching that as well. We've got one episode left. Um, I don't know. It's not really worked for me, I don't think. It's kind of an odd it, like there's parts that I really like like actually weirdly makes me want to read the book because I think the hard mm. science stuff is the stuff that I 
like the most and I kind of I kind of would like to see more exploring of that kind of stuff and mm. it kind of makes me think of a of like someone watching something like the flash like the old, like the, like the TV show like they all the teen the the teen characters they all, they're not teens so you scholars but they're it feels very kind of like teen drama at times and I, they kind of annoy me a little bit so it puts me off a little bit but I do love the mm. kind of scope of it and the the how big it is and the kind of ideas of it all are, are, are quite cool yeah I would agree with you like I think the thing I like is I don't read a lot of science fiction because I, I struggle with some of the hard science but I watch a lot of science fiction because I find mm -hmm. it a lot more accessible and I love the ideas I'd agree with you the three body problem the characters are not really characters to me they're just yeah, there to tell I, the plot exactly um, I think that's exactly it yeah yeah exactly um, yeah but yeah, well, the the very very last thing we always do is a super quick fire either or, and oh. I always say there's no right answer in ten of these apart from perhaps one of them. But we'll start off with um, short stories or books, or full length. I know, books, I know. <laughs> oh, books. Uh, uh, TV or cinema? TV. Um, Night owl or early bird? Early bird. Uh, music or no music when you're writing? Oh, music with no lyrics. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the last one, um, a paper book or an e-book? Oh, see, but paper book to have and put in my bookshelf, but e-book because I do a lot of my reading in the dark because my son's asleep beside me and I can't hold a paper book open. <laughs> <laughs> So if you no. had to pick one, oh, a paper book. Oh <laughs> man, I thought you I always make that mistake. Tarek. I would have taken the word. Tarek, Tarek wants people to say ebook, um, and yeah, no, but, no, very I, few I, I do. Just, I just I feel ebook just gets a bad rap, and no one ever fights for it. So I feel like I just got to stand up for it. <laughs> I think no, ebooks are so much more accessible, and yeah convenient but i think that, listen listen you've made your you've think, made your bed don't don't try and you know backtrack now and make ebook feel better the is, but the dream that i was saying my, my childhood dream was not to be on like a phone exactly i know i know i totally holding. agree I, I, that is a very fair point yeah that's that. yeah absolutely. <laughs> no one ever dreams of themselves being on an ebook they dream of themselves being on the shelf yeah I know, I know, that's, yes. that's fair So even with the question changed, Tarek, to paper book rather than <laughs> e-book, which some have said that the, the use of real is, is yes, uh, because an unfair... Yes, because e-books are real as well, of Yes, course. exactly. Yeah. Uh, still didn't make a difference at the end of the yeah. day. Although you could have claimed they that always, one as a win almost and you pushed it too I think it I should far. stop because always, people always give that kind of response like, well, I love... Paper books are great, but e-books are so good because this... And, and then I'm like, oh, here we go, yes, yes. And then they pull the rug out from under me. So I wonder if I should just stop at that point and not clarify it and just say yeah that sounds like a win yeah uh, i think that would be a a, a better tactic for you <laughs> but uh, on on the subject of um dune i haven't seen dune 2 i love no i've not seen Dune 2 yet either villeneuve's films generally arrival is probably my favorite film ever mm -hmm. um but i've been watching dune part one again with my daughters because i was wanting to get them to see dune part two because i do want to see it Mm -hmm. But I don't know. There's just I've I've not read the books, so hands up there. But I find it odd for someone that you know. I like sci-fi. I like stories with great lore and world building and things like that. But I I, I struggle it's everything to in it that you think. Yeah, you should it's like, it's yeah. got all the ingredients, but it's got the villainy, I just got... struggle to get into it as much as I thought I would, even I, on I, a second viewing of part one. You know. I probably agree with you, to be honest. I, I I haven't seen part two yet. Um, saw part one in the cinema. I haven't seen it since. And I remember enjoying it, but not being blown away by it. Or or as some people were, you know, some people were saying it was the kind of best sci-fi film ever. And, and I know Dune is a really, you know, high iconic. up there, yeah, yeah. iconic story. And, and I have to say, I, I read the book before seeing the film and, and I didn't actually think the book was that great. Like it didn't really work for me. And I know... I'm probably the minority of that. Um, I felt like Dune very much the book and actually the film of part one had a really good first kind of act or third mm -hmm. up until the kind of assault on the yeah. on the family. And then after that, the book got quite 
boring for me. I never really, I, I never really gripped me after that. And I felt this, the film part one was very similar. Like a, it really kind of felt quite. Yeah, the, fi- the film certainly part one. Of, the part one film suffers from being half a story. You know, uh, that, I've never yeah, seen a film that is more true. openly half a story. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it just sort of ends in the middle of, <laughs> in the middle of yeah. a scene almost. Um, uh, which is fine and it may be that June part one. two when I watch both of them together is what I need to do to really get into it but yeah I don't know why it, it's a strange one I just I would have thought that it would it would pull me I mean, in more no, as you say, than especially it, than it based on who who's making it I mean I, yeah. I also love his stuff Blade Runner 2049 Arrival Sicario are all mm-hmm. Prisoners brilliant he's, he's, he's a f- phenomenal filmmaker but yeah June just didn't quite work for me and it, I, but also the book didn't quite work for me so I don't know if it's I can't really blame him I'll blame Frank Herbert oh, shit book. <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> um, I will say what I enjoyed I enjoyed June more than Three Body Problem which um, I was kinder to when we were chatting to Eliza but I have to say it's not really working for me at all I'm not enjoying it it's it's just very I don't know. There's some parts of it I like, like the concept. Some of the sci-fi concepts are cool. Um, it feels kind of Arthur C. Clarke in a lot of ways. The kind of yeah. time dilation and these alien spaceships, alien uh, people from 400 years and on their way. Blah blah. blah but spoilers. But yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's not really. It's not. I think it maybe built up my head too much as well as this kind of big, massive event TV. I Game told you to watch Shogun. And you chose to watch three. No, no, I know. I'm waiting, but I'm waiting for Shogun to be all there. I will watch Shogun. That is on my list. That is on my list. I love Japanese stuff. So that's that's going to be Shogun is very good. But anyway, um, we're we're ranting, rambling on about uh, stuff that had nothing really to do with with that chat with Eliza. So thank you very much to Eliza for for coming on to the podcast. I thought that was a really interesting chat, and you know, it, it is interesting, and I think very important that there is more representation being found in publishing in books in mm-hmm. in stories like this because i feel that representation such as there was in the past was limited to a very n- sort of niche area of types yeah. of stories that yeah. publishers quotes allowed to get published and i feel that there is slowly as ever with these things there is slowly uh, a widening of that which is which is always a good thing i think yeah yeah and i think i think it's interesting the kind of delineation that Eliza makes between the kind of the folklore and the subgenres of myth yeah. retelling, etc. And I think she's probably right in the sense that I think Greek mythology retellings have been massive for a few years, and they probably are at that kind of saturation point, aren't they? Um, but but I, I and I also agree with her that it would be a shame if if if, if the marketplace took that to mean people are sick of mythology yeah. books completely because that's just Absolutely. there's so much more isn't there as she says than, than just the, the Greek stuff um, and yeah. and yeah so I think I'm hoping that it is a kind of a movement towards bigger wider expanse of stories told by different people and, and, and we're not just kind of seeing it come to an end yeah, and I'm absolutely here for a story about hopping vampires, which I didn't oh, know. Oh, man, that sounds about, really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds very oh, yeah. cool. Brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah, you can go and grab Fathom Folk and, and keep it in the bestseller lists. Um, we'll put a link in the podcast description. Um, but next week, we have another great guest. Yeah, next week, we're chatting with Jasper Ford, who um, has a really interesting way in to his, his writing uh, career. He started off working on films. Focus Puller on Goldeneye. Yes. Pretty cool, Worked pretty cool film, film yeah, to work yeah. on. Uh-huh. Um, and now he's written, I mean, tons. He's written about, I don't know, 10 plus, 15 plus books now. Like different series, a kind of really but, esoteric kind of... Yeah, I was going to say wildly series. imaginative stuff. Yeah. The sort of stuff that not a lot of people can... I mean, we talked to him about this and to him, he, he just says it's just... It, the way, it's just the way what he thinks, thinks about it. it's just the yeah. way he thinks but you know it's, it's you know the nursery crime series where it's like treating Humpty Dumpty's yeah. death as a real murder to the extent that he researched how a bullet would react being shot through and ate a large egg and things like this <laughs> and so. there's, the, there's the Thursday next series where he's got people uh, who chases a thriller series who chases the body through different books yeah like Jane Eyre and stuff and yeah just really yeah. 
out yeah, there stuff. Really cool. It is. So, and it, as you would expect from from someone with that those ideas, it's a really really interesting chat. So, mm-hmm. um, please do tune in for that one. If you've enjoyed today's episode. Uh, please do take the time to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favourite podcast app uh, as that helps us to continue to get great guests on the podcast. And if you want to get in touch, you can always reach us by email, emailing us at uh, podcast at rightgear.co.uk or you can send us, uh, well, I see a tweet in the Twitter machine, but any any an X in the X machine doesn't quite work. What do you call the, it? What, what, what is it called now? I have no tweet. idea. I, I just call it Twitter, though. I yeah, refuse to call right. it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, you can get that on any social media platform um, by just searching for at UK page one. Yes, and you'll find us there not tweeting or posting very oh, much. Or X. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, have a great week and we will speak to you again next week. See you later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below. Hit that thumbs up button. And be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm-hmm.